This rig rundown is presented by the Yamaha DXR Series. This is Steve Cook with Premier Guitar and PremierGuitar.com. I'm here with Legendary. Can I say Legendary? Oh, I don't know. You're I don't think I'm that old yet. Okay, well... <laughs> I'm with, lying, but... With Neil Sean, and we're in a, a secret location uh, backstage in the Vibe Room, which is awesome. Thanks for letting us in. Secret location. It, it's kind of secret. But, uh, you know, we, we were doing this uh, a couple years ago with Premier Guitar. We did the rig rundown, and, uh, you know, some things have changed a little bit for you. you uh, then you just had a prototype uh, for your PRS, um, and now you're actually holding maybe the next... Uh, the this next is phase. actually another prototype okay. of that original guitar that you saw. Okay. And, you know, the, the one that I still play that is one of the original 15s is a spruce top. And this is a curly maple top. And actually, it's, it's very much thicker. I don't know if you took, like, close-ups, but if you look at this top, there's a whole lot of extra poundage right. in this guitar. Right. In which I thought, I asked them to make it a bit heavier. Okay. Um, to avoid... A little bit of the, you know, uh, feedback issues uh, close to monitors and stuff like that on stage. And uh, I didn't find out until later that he actually, I asked him to make it solid all the way through. And that he ended up leaving it hollow and he made the top thicker. Okay. And so I don't know if it alleviated the problem <laughs> or made it sound any better to tell you the truth. But I, I'm still playing the other one more than this. So um, I like the first one better. All right. At least but at least this one honest. looks better. It looks and amazing. I'm brutally honest, and that's just what the deal is. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> does that one still have the mahogany uh, block inside? Or uh, yes. Okay. Yes, mahogany sides and mahogany block inside, and curly maple back. This is amazing. I mean, that's, front, that's yeah, the back. I mean, is, it is just insane. you know, Paul is definitely one of the best, if not the best, guitar maker out there. You know, there are other guitars that sound good, you know. I mean, I still love Fenders, you know. Fenders making me a lot of stuff in the custom shop. Um, I'm really digging a lot of the Relic stuff that they're making for me lately. Mm -hmm. uh, with aged woods, it, there is a difference. It's like, it's crazy. And I'm, you know, playing, you know, I play, you know, a Strat on lights and the reverse headstock. You know, I never even messed around with it before because I thought it was just kind of like a cliche Hendrix thing. Right. Like, well, it's supposed to look like Jimi Hendrix. But really, after I played it, um, and I realized that, no, actually, there's a function to it. And there's a reason that he liked it, too, is because the E string is much shorter. You know, right. without a tie down. With this, it doesn't make any difference. With a Floyd, but without, you know, a tie down, the E string is very much shorter. So it's a lot slinkier. And the lower strings are much more stout because they're longer. And talking about your lights guitar, which we're gonna, which we're gonna go talk to Adam in a little bit and go and go uh, mess with all those. But learn that you've uh, you reversed uh, the bridge pickup on that lights guitar. Uh, yeah. What was, yeah. What was the thing? Well, you know that? what the deal was is like about I would say like about six to seven years ago, I had the idea of just doing you know a right-handed reversed strap without the body reverse because I wanted to be able to get up on top. And so it all started like that. They didn't do the reverse headstock, but I did the pickups backwards. Okay. Because there is something to that too. I mean, any Hendrix fan knows that the tone is just like insane. And it's thick on the top and more stout on the bottom, you know? And so the pickups lean in like this instead of that. Right. And, um, you know, it, it, there's something to it. If we see those pop up on their production models, we'll know where it came from. <laughs> well, yeah. they're making them now. Are they? Like uh, the the couple that I have um, that I'm playing now with the reverse headstock and a pickup configuration back. I was down actually at the factory um, when Larry was still there, and Larry was taking me through it. And one of the guys came out and they said, "Hey, check out this new, you know, Hendrix relic." And I go, "Dude, I ordered that like five years ago." <laughs> and the guy was like, "Oh shit!" Oh, sorry. <laughs> And speaking of features, so the uh, the heel on this one is is this this is your sort of well this whole guitar is your design, but you know uh, the but big deal that that I did with this one um, that I didn't want Paul to do on any of his other ones he tried to do it and I said no you can't. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but he's gonna kill me after this interview. But you know he had the bigger guitar you know before he had a 15 inch body, uh, which is you know the body design is nothing. Brand new, it looks like a, a regular jazz box, and you know, a bit thicker, and but the neck kind of stopped 
like right about there. And, you know, you couldn't get it, you couldn't get up in it or it went back further and I just couldn't get to the top. And so I said, I, I need this neck moved out this way. And so like when I'm at the top, I can actually reach it and not be doing this right. like you do on some guitars right. where the thumb is actually not even on the back of the neck anymore. Right. You know, so um, after a lot of reconstructing everything in the computers, which he tells me is very difficult, they put it together and, and I love what this is, you know. And the new 14s uh, that he's making me actually too out of the private stock now, instead of having, you know, we went for the my old neck joint that I had on the Les Pauls originally that, that I redesigned. Mm -hmm. And it didn't quite come out like that. There wasn't enough meat on it for me. So like, I'd rather have a hump, something to hold on to when I'm up at the high end rather than just going in and there's nothing there. Sure. And so I worked with Gibson a really long time on making that neck joint, even though it went smoothly to the top, there was a big piece of wood there. And that was about, you know, two years of going back and forth with them with, with you know, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, prototypes. And so finally they got it and it was very close to what I used to have actually with, that I went back and forth with Aria years ago. Okay. And then Jackson. And so, you know, they got my neck joint and, um, and then everything kind of fell apart. And so, you know, we tried to do it with Paul, but it didn't quite, you know, I, I wasn't that crazy about it and I didn't end up playing it that much. I'm still playing the 15s more than the 14s. I like that I've gotten so used to the bigger body and you know, and I like the the thinner, the thinness. I like the sound of my original ones that he made that are a little bit thicker. All right, so now you've got a lot of high gain amps running out there. You've got the uh, PRS, you've got the diesel, um, but you have a hollow body guitar or semi hollow body guitar. How do you cut down on feedback? Um, you know what? There's there's very little volume on stage. Okay. I'm basically going through. I have a little bit of uh, my my send from uh, the fractal mm -hmm. unit. Uh, in my monitors on stage, the side monitors, a little bit in my wedges in front, and that's really it. I'm pretty much playing, you know, off of my in ears and listening to the PA, because I mean, you know, even though the in ears are closed up, you start sweating one song in and they start popping out, right. unless you glue them in your ears, you know. Sure. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I really like hearing more of the PA. I find like I play better if I'm, you know, further away from the amps any longer even like I haven't recorded in a studio for such a long time where I'm in the same room as the amp and you know some people swear by it you know because it picks up through your pickups mm -hmm. you get all kinds of extra feedback it depends what kind of part you're doing I think right. if you're playing rhythm and you want to get like you know the Townsend feedback or Hendrick you want to go in the studio uh, or in the room with the amp but otherwise I play like with little monitors I mean I don't even like the big monitors in the studio and I play really like as loud as I'm talking that's my playback. That's how I like to record. And I like to record with the guitar sunk in the track. Not like most engineers, they crank me up, you know, where I'm right. above the track. Right. When I'm playing, I go, no, man, I need to hear, I want to hear the track. Let me just hear the track and very little of myself. And I'm playing so quietly that I can actually, I can hear. You can feel your fingers and hear the actual strings on the neck and you can hear actually how hard you're hitting the strings or you're not hitting them. And then you get more finesse, I feel like, when you're not just like blaring through things. And it's wonderfully old school, you know? I mean, it's, you know, and we, we know you embrace the technology, you know, live, but, but to play quieter in the studio, you know, I mean, they weren't cranking it out in the 60s, you know, um, you know, Motown guys aren't cranking, you know, no, I, 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 Yeah, I think it's highly yeah, overrated. So, yeah. Just volume is, I, I like hearing us in front. I like hearing us nice and full. I don't like it so loud to where you can tell, you know, if somebody's mixing too loud and people are kind of looking at you like this with that, that hurt look on their face, right. like, ouch, just painful, you know? I mean, you like to have them moved, you know, with bottom end and fullness, sounding like a big jukebox, but... You don't want to like plow them over like there's standing in front of a jet engine. You Do you know? find yourself one in, one out on your in-ears? Um, I, I, I pull one in and out throughout the night to kind of check out the mix in front because I can sort of judge what's going on. Yeah. Um, uh, otherwise, you know, it's Adam is so good that I never even take sound checks. 
unless we're going to rehearse. Sometimes we rehearse backstage here, and we just go through the tune and you know figure out what we want to do to it. Um, but the road crew, everybody plays in a road crew, and so they sound check for us every day, which is really great because then you don't have to come in. Being a headliner, we you know if you wanted sound check, you have to go in at three o'clock, kind of like blows the whole middle of the day and depending on where you're staying in a hotel and how far you have to travel sure. to get in sure like we today yeah like, so exactly so let's get them in now how many how many models or prototypes did you go through before you came out i mean did he you said there's back and forth with other companies what there's, was the back and forth on this on this guitar on this a guitar. lot yeah there's a lot he's been extremely patient with me that's cool, that's cool. Well, you've got it i mean you've got it loaded to the gills with your with your, I mean, you've got the sustainer, you know, you've got your, you know, pickup. Right, and your... it's so wild. I mean, I still use this, but I don't step on it half as much as I used to, you know. Uh, I've been playing a lot more uh, with my fingers, I found, just because I'm, I'm chucking picks, you know. Right. And I'm in the middle of a solo, and I usually don't reach down for another one. So I found that, you know, some people discover their thumb because they drop a motor into a hot rod and it busts and there's a bone sticking out when the cast comes on or they have to practice with a cast. They're like Jeff Beck, right. you know? Right. And I discovered that, you know, playing off the tip of my index finger uh, and where I have no nail when I come off tour, this thing is usually just whittled down to nothing from going like this on the strings, but I can, I can play with the precision of a pick and it sounds better. Right on. And so, I'm now thinking about maybe even trying an acrylic nail on here just so it won't wear down on one finger um, because I'm doing that much more and I kind of just hold it with my thumb like I'm holding a pick and I, and I, you know, I pick the same way. And it sounds, you can hear it like. Where's a friend of you need it? <laughs> character with the fingers. Again, I'm not getting a really great sound to you. You know what? Let's do this for a second. Sure. Okay, let me get this out of the way. I'm finding that, and actually, when you're more ampli, you know, if you, when you have your amplification on on stage and everything is more touch sensitive, you, you back off the guitar more and just like kind of feel it, find a sweet spot for your fingers hitting the strings to get that that tone that you want. And you said feel. I mean, and when you touch, you know, actually physically touch those strings, then you're they gonna, sound different yeah. too. I mean, there's you know, there's a reason that Wes Montgomery did it back in the day, and right. you know, a lot of you know, Beck does it, and you know, I mean, people have been doing it forever. Yeah. It, it, I think you know, it's it's easier to play with a pick, you know, because of the accuracy. And if you really want to play like shreddy fast with without doing, you know, just all finger pulls, then you probably want to use a pick. But but you know, for like fatness and hitting like notes and wanting them to sing a little more, I think it sounds better. And I just like finished a new record that's sitting on the shelf um, with, with Jan Hammer, Steve Smith, and um, Igor Lynn, and I played bass on it again. It's sort of like a follow-up to The Calling, not the last record I did with So You. But in, I've got like about 95 minutes um, worth of instrumental music. It's all instrumental. And I discovered while I was doing the record, I dropped the pick a couple times in the middle of live solos with Smith where we were just like going at it. And these songs are like 
epically long. I went for like really, I said, I'm not going to go so much for like overproducing this one and doing a lot of overdubs. I want to get a live feel. Uh, so when people listen to it, they go, oh, this is, I can sort of imagine this is what it's going to be like if they play live, mm -hmm. you know. And so that's what I went for. And I'm really happy with the result. And, you know, like I, I was in the middle of a solo and I dropped a pick and I just kept playing. And then I listened back, you know, you don't really notice it while you're playing. But when you're listening back to when you've been recording and you hear what it sounds like with a pick and then you hear what it sounds like without a pick, I was like, wow, it's radically different. And it kind of sticks out in the track mm -hmm. a little differently. It, it fits in and it sticks out in a different way. And you kept it? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I kept a lot of stuff that normally I would like redo, but I was going for a live thing. And so I just like, and I don't really sit there and work on solos like some people do. You know, I mean, I'll, if I'm not happy with something, I'll do two, two, three, four takes. And it usually gets worse and worse every time. And I'll go, okay, let's just move on. We'll do something different and go to something fresh. And I'll come in the next day and try it again fresh. And then it usually pops out. Gotcha. You know? Mm -hmm. But if you sit there for hours and you go over it, it's what you're going to get. It's going right. to sound like you're thinking and right. no feel, you know? And it's interesting, and if I may embarrass you, I mean, you've written, you know, and played so many iconic guitar solos. And, uh, and so it's interesting for me to hear, and I know our viewers to hear, you know, that maybe some of those were just, you know, here they are, and this is what you they get. They were all off know? the cuff. I that's, mean, that's I, there was very few that I sat there and worked on, and... The ones that I, I really remember sitting there and working on because they didn't fly out of me naturally sound like that, you know, still to this day when I go back and listen. So I'm better on the fly. You know, I'm really more from a, a blues and R&B place where I came from. Right. And those are still my roots. So even though I don't play it that much anymore, I'm going to get I'm getting back to it, you know. And um, so, yeah, I mean. The blues saying is, if you're thinking, you're stinking. And so it's, it's kind of like that. Awesome. Just let it fall out, you know. Well, let's hear some more. While you're falling out, let's play, let's play us out. Play us out, Neil. <laughs> Thank you for your time. You're awesome. He's got a concert to do in like 20 minutes, and so he's sitting here talking with we us. We just so. got here. <laughs> I never, I'm locked everybody out of their own room, and it's I gotta let good. them in. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Talk, we're gonna go talk to Adam. We're gonna look at some guitars, some amps, some lots of pedals. See you soon. Hey everybody, this is Steve Cook coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee, the lovely and scenic Bridgestone Arena. I'm here with Adam Day. Adam, walk us through the signal chain from Alpha to the Omega. All right, basically from the rack, uh, it comes out here into the uh, Dunlop Classic Crybaby. Out of that into the Boss Compressor Sustainer, uh, into the Big Muff uh, Electro Harmonics. Out of that into the Wampler Nirvana Chorus. All right, so Adam, we're coming out of the Wampler and we're going to the racks, correct? Yes, we're going back to the rack where the signal will be split. Okay, well, let's pause on the racks for a second. We'll uh -huh. get there in one second. Let's talk about the rest of this Christmas light display that's happening over All here right. with the fractal controller and uh, any this, other This is a, a fractal MFC 101 foot controller. It basically controls all the presets of the uh, Axe FX units as well as uh, the channel changes for the uh, tube amps. Um, we've got a couple expression pedals here that uh, we have set up for delay and reverb on most of the patches. Some of the other stuff will uh, control uh, various other uh, expressions uh, in the patches we're using. Okay. Um, we also have a synth synthesizer volume pedal here for the Roland uh, Phantom guitar synth. Um, over here is a volume pedal for the uh, uh, Gibson Echo Plex, which, which is down here uh, at your shins? Down here. Yep. And uh, he's basically been using that as a looper. He'll play over it like a sound on sound kind of thing. Okay. And at the end here is the foot controller for that Echoplex. And he will monitor the time that something is actually being recorded uh, via this Echoplex here that we see. Awesome. Can you, can you show us that? Can you pop that yeah. real quick? 
as he's so, monitoring the time. So Yeah, so basically as he's playing along, he can hit this and go into record function. And anything he's playing right now is being recorded. Then he'll stop and engage the volume pedal and it'll basically be on sound on sound. He'll be playing over whatever he's just recorded. Awesome. And that's really, and he can overdub on top of that and he can put it in reverse and he can do whatever he wants to do. Wow. And, and I, I have to ask, yes. just because we're here, cellophane, talk to me about the, yeah, uh, the saran wrap. Uh, the cellophane was actually done originally to keep uh, the weather out. Uh, we had a couple places where the stage wasn't fully covered and uh, <clears throat> the best option was to to cover all the all the pedals in the uh, in the signal path. Um, that way we could keep the uh, keep the pedal board out where it needs to be as long as possible right. in adverse weather conditions. Um, and but it's, uh, we're inside right now. And yep. It's not going to rain. No, it's not going to rain. Uh, however, I found that a lot of the uh, the plastic does help keeping the plugs and the switches clean. So a lot of times we'll keep the cellophane on. So tip for all of you at home, keep your stuff clean by wrapping it in cellophane. And if you're going to fraternity parties like we used to do, cover it in cellophane, yeah. makes it last a lot longer. Absolutely. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an inexpensive and easy way to do it. And I'd like to also uh, show you one other item. Oh we yeah, we didn't, we didn't talk about that. This is a uh, Roland GI-20. It's the interface for his guitar synthesizer. Basically the guitar will go into this and he can control presets and patches of the synth sounds uh, and this will feed the Roland Phantom synthesizer module in the rack and he can use this with the guitar signal as well or uh, or alone. He's got a wide palette. Yes, yeah, there's a lot going on here. There's <laughs> a lot going on here yet somehow it all makes sense. Well he'll make it make sense. Yeah he will. Um, speaking of making sense we're gonna make all this make sense by going down to the racks and checking out where this signal jumps in. All right, so you're gonna walk us through this rack. Now, it's a big rack, but not the biggest Neil's had out. He's downsized it a little bit. We have, and I think, uh, I think it's been more practical now and, and more user-friendly, and we've had great reviews with the sound this time around, and so we're very pleased with that. Well, we heard some of Soundtrack, and uh, yeah, there's some good stuff happening. I'll wait till he plays it. Yeah. I was trying to beef you up there a little bit. I appreciate bit. it. Sure. Well, so we're coming out of the Wampler off uh, off the deck, and, yeah. uh, and we're coming in where? We come off uh, out of the Wampler all the uh, the pre-pedals in front of everything, and we come back in, and we'll hit a splitter in the back of the rack, which will split the signal into sending it to two Axe Effects units as well as all the tube amplifiers. Um, uh, the tube amplifiers will basically go to an ISO cab and be mic'd up and that'll be one of the inputs that front of house and monitors receive. Um, as far as the axe effects, um, it'll come into the axe effects and we will use three outputs. We'll use two stereo processed outputs as well as a mono dry output. So there'll be four outputs all together that monitors in front of house see. Um, <clears throat> the two stereo outputs will go into the, uh, the line level mixer which also gets uh, the Phantom Guitar Synthesizer as well as the Echoplex Looper. Um, and basically out of that we send the two, uh, the two outputs, the stereo outputs of the Fractal uh, included in the, uh, well, I'm stumbling here. You're fine. Uh, the two <laughs> outputs out of the mixer will include the Fractal outputs the synthesizer outputs, as well as the Echoplex output. So the end of the signal chain concludes with the Roland M120 mixer, and uh, that basically will have stereo outputs out of that. Um, you want to run us through just basically top to bottom? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot in here, but it's sure. not all being used. However, uh, let me run through it here. You have to do it blindfolded. By yeah, the way. I might be able to do it. Okay. I might not be able to. Uh, we've got a Furman power conditioner here, a Korg pitch black tuner, which I run parallel with the uh, Peterson strobe tuner. Um, Electrosonics wireless uh, R400 receivers. Um, basically, that's the front of the signal chain, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, out of that, it'll send out of the rack into the uh, uh, pedals on the pedal board before coming back. 
Um, splitting the uh, wireless signals is a uh, whirlwind uh, uh, switcher, and I can select between the four receivers uh, on the front of the rack or via a uh, remote foot switch. Um, below that is a Demeter tube uh, direct preamp. We're not using it right now, but it's come in and out of play the last few years. And of course, the Roland mixer and a spare mixer. The Echoplex, we saw an Echoplex at the uh, pedal board. Mm -hmm. That's basically a monitor, and it, it sees whatever this sees. This is getting the signal. That's just syn synced up as a, uh, as a monitor to show him the time that when he's recording. Um, then we go down to the Axe FX, a main Axe FX, a spare. Um, below that is a Roland Phantom XR for his synthesizer sounds. Mm -hmm. Below that is a Crybaby, uh, Dunlop Crybaby DSR remote wah. Uh, not currently using that at the moment. And a uh, Furman voltage regulator. And uh, below that are a couple Nady, very old I should say, Nady Thunder amps that we would use uh, on stage to, to monitor his sound. Um, not using them currently, but it's, a, uh, it's an amp that he's used in the past that he's uh, grown fond of. And they're old and they're funky, but they work for him. But as I said, we're not currently using them. We have no cabinets on stage. But does he ever fire them up just because? I mean, just ask you one day. No. Well, that's just, probably better for you. We, yeah, we don't. <laughs> when we had cabinets on stage, they were powered in the, power in the cabinets uh, of the Axe Effects and they had a nice, tight, low end. Uh, certainly not the top of the technology chain today, but uh, like I said, they work for him. Right on. And speaking of amps, uh, we've got several stacked up over here. Yes, uh, we've, we've uh, just started using the Paul Reed Smith Arshon, and uh, he's been very pleased with it. And as I mentioned before, it's one of the four uh, sounds that he's using um, and sending to uh, front of house and basically the one head is powering an ISO cabinet uh, that's mic'd up with a high microphone mm -hmm. and uh, it's running parallel with the uh, the fractal at all times. And you have different tubes? Yeah right now use? we're using the uh, the 6L6 model but uh, sometimes we'll go to the L34 depending how he feels. Okay. And, um, and sometimes we'll even use a diesel, which we've used quite a bit in the past. And it's, uh, we know what we're getting with that, and it's been the fail safe through the years. Right on, and you can override this whole system? You yeah, can... I can override it via the front panel. I've also got an, uh, an extra pedal board I can, I can put out here if need be. Okay. Essentially, he's very hands-on with his, his pedals, and he likes to do all that, but I can override it via the front of the rack. Uh, with the fractals. And uh, you know, all these fantastic equipment and then what's the red light? Ah, the red light. Uh, I know, it's kind of a uh, Basically, this, this can override channel switching for the uh, Paul Reed Smith amp. Okay. That's really simply all that is. All right. And at the bottom of all this is a Furman uh, UPS battery. In case we lose everything, he can do a guitar solo for about 25 minutes. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it all going. Yeah. Keep it all going. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, can we walk through some of these guitars yeah. uh, behind you? Adam, we've got a nice array of guitars and PRSs, Fenders, and the like in front of us. Can you run us through some of these? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'll show you an older PRS double cutaway. This he's had for quite some time. Um, it's got a lot of his bells and whistles on here. It's got the uh, synth, the Roland synth pickup. Um, the, the uh, Fernandez sustainer, um, basically frets everything to his specs. And uh, as I mentioned, this is an older one he's had around him. This is basically as a, a spare drop D guitar for uh, Wheel in the Sky. Okay. And the uh, pickups? Uh, the pickups are Seymour Duncan Custom Custom in the back, uh, DiMarzio Fast Track, single coil in the front and the sustainer driver as well and he's about i mean 
He's about the higher output uh, pickups, isn't he? Um, I mean, in his PRSs, or am I making that up? They're a relatively high output, not the highest. Okay. Um, next guitar is his signature model. This is a 15 inch um, single cut, semi hollow. Uh, the wood block in the middle goes down to about right here. Okay. And this is completely his design from the ground up. It's beautiful. Uh, every spec is his. And the same thing, pickup wise, the Seymour Duncan Custom Custom, DiMarzio Fast Track, and this uh, Fernandez Sustainer Driver. And uh, what gauges, uh, strings are you using? These are 9 to 42. Okay. Uh, this is a drop D for Wheel in the Sky, so we actually put a 46 on the low E, which is a D. Okay. Uh, the next guitar is a backup for the song Lights, and this is a um, Fender Strat Relic Michael Landau model. And uh, it's been on the road for about 35 years. No, wow. I'm kidding. It's, it's about... Yeah, uh, about 10 minutes. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, about, it's about three months old, right. actually. <laughs> so the Fender Custom Shop does an amazing job. They do. And uh, this guitar sounds great. It is a stock. I mean, obviously, it's completely stock. stock. It's all Michael Landau right. specs from his uh, signature design. Excellent. And uh, the next one is also a Fender Strat relic. Notice the left-handed neck. Hmm. Um, this was basically an ideal of Neil's, and the actual uh, rear pickup is off-center like a left-handed body would be and uh, this has a unique sound because it's not as bright on the top end and it's got a little bit more bite on the low end just be basically because of the angle of the pickup and uh, it's well relicked as well as you can tell and are those stock pickups stock fenders or are they yeah these are stock okay. fenders as well um, but this guitar sounds great for and is that his that. is that his lights guitar yes yes now excellent uh, this is an, another backup for uh, basically the same model, but this is a uh, Fender Custom Shop Strat that was basically all Neil's idea. And uh, it's also got the Roland synth pickup as well as the uh, Fernandez sustainer. Same pickup combination, um, frets and neck to Neil's specs, uh, Neil's neck contour. And how are how are the frets or the neck different or you know, from uh, from maybe stock models? Uh, well, you said his spec, so are there yeah, jumbo frets, it's, smaller frets. Typically, he likes uh, relatively large frets, uh, brought down a bit. Okay. So they're not the highest they can be, and they're not necessarily the fattest, but they're they're a good size fret. He likes to get under the strings. Um, this is a sister to the last one. Basically, we're using this as, as the main, and uh, he'll use this on select songs tonight. Okay. Like James Bond, with the usual refinements. Yes, of course. All right. Sensing a trend. Yes. Uh, the next one here is another PRS. This is uh, also his model, his line of models. Uh, this is a 13-inch solid body. Uh, once again, to all his specs. Um, there's also a few things in these guitars that I hadn't mentioned, but some of them have capacitors as for tone bleeds and the volumes, uh, so we can use certain, get certain sounds at lower volumes. Okay. Um, all equipped with Floyd Rose. Yeah, all the f original Floyd Rose, um, and once again the sus uh, Fernandez sustainer, and the typical pickup alignment. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. And moving on to one of his original 15-inch semi-hollows. This was uh, early on uh, one of the first prototypes of this model. And once again, this is a semi-hollow 15-inch, uh, basically to, to haul his specs. Now, when did this come out? Uh, this came out about three years ago, I think. Okay, uh, and how has it changed 
or evolved to what to, to maybe the newer one since you said this was the, um, one of the prototypes? Well, this actually has a spruce top. The, some of the later ones have maple tops. Um, and I think you can get them either or as far as a wood combination. This has a unique sound being spruce on top. Mm -hmm. um, they all have a unique sound anyway, but they, and they all sound great. So, and the next one is even uh, an earlier version of that prototype. And this is basically his main live guitar at this point. We carry about 35 guitars on the road and okay. <clears throat> break out about 10 a night and he'll use five or six during a show. Now are all 35 available? So to speak, are they? I mean, is it again? He's a gear guy, and so he may get a whim and say, "Hey, can we pull that one out?" Yes, they're all accessible. Okay, they're all accessible. Okay. We have acoustics, we have double necks. There's uh, an array of instruments available, just depending on it, depending on his mood and uh, what songs they want to play. Sure. sure. And the last one here is one of the later versions of that 15-inch. Uh, signature series, but uh, this has a beautiful flame maple top, as you can see, and back. It's fantastic and long necks, amazing. And when you're purchasing one of these as a consumer, if I'm getting one of these from PRS, I mean, are they? Do they come like this? They don't come com completely like this. What honestly. do you What do you have to add? Um, from PRS, basically, this will go to San Francisco to Gary Brower, who is a, uh, a luthier in the area and uh, quite, a, quite a genius as well and uh, uh, a mentor of mine as well. So can't do it without Gary. But he'll install the sustainers uh, in all the guitars okay. and uh, sets them up to Neil's specs. Um, and they can be a little tricky to set up and align properly and make them sound correct. But Gary's a genius at it. So from Gary's, it'll uh, it'll usually come out to us, and we'll f you know fine tune it, set it up from there. Um, it's a pretty much stock, with the exception of the sustainers. I, I mean. believe so. Okay. And okay. Uh, yeah, that's at it for Excellent. this guitar. <clears throat> Excellent. Well, thanks for letting us into your world. Uh, my pleasure. And making this. Big old mess. And yeah, well, it's always a treat. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Have a great show tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Don't forget to sign up for PG Perks, your all-access pass to exclusive gear giveaways and discounts on PremierGuitar.com.